Bon matin, good morning, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur Kawamura, Dr. Alper, cher conférencier et auditeur. Mon nom est Scott Simon, professeur à l'École d'études sociologiques et anthropologiques et chercheur au Centre d'études en politique internationale à l'Université d'Ottawa. Je suis très heureux de vous accueillir chez nous ce matin pour ce webinaire. Le CEPI, au centre de la capitale fédérale, est le premier centre universitaire du Canada pour l'analyse et pour le débat sur les affaires internationales. Minasan, Yokoso, Okoshi, Kodasai Mashita. I know that most of our speakers and probably most of our listeners are far away from Ottawa and Kichisipi, the Grand River of Ottawa, that has been a historical meeting place of nations for millennia. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Kichi Miigwech. My own scientific work has long been inspired by Japanese scholarship, and I continue to work with Dr. Nobayashi Atsushi and other colleagues at the National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka, where I have been a visiting scholar. My own work, however, is only a small part of the scientific cooperation between this country and Japan. Algonquin elder William Kamanda, who has an honorary doctorate at the University of Ottawa and the building named after him, invited many Japanese guests to his home in Kiriganzibi, especially in his annual Circle of All Nations. He was so inspired by Japan that in 2009, when appointed to the Order of Canada, he cited Japanese scientist Dr. Emoto Masuro as one of the inspirations for his work of international peace and river conservation. When I visited the Ainu in Hokkaido, I learned that their ancestors had ancient trade routes that connected them to the Inuit. In modern times, Japan and Canada established diplomatic relations in 1928. When Canada opened its diplomatic mission in Tokyo, it was effectively our third embassy in the world, following only the United States and France. Canada and Japan, which share common values of democracy and human rights, now have very rich academic and scientific relations. The University of Ottawa is proud to be part of the Kakehashi Project and has entered into agreements with four Japanese universities. Today's event is one more component of this unfolding relationship between Canada and Japan. We have faced many challenges together and that long history has set the foundation for our scientific cooperation as together we address the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank everybody for coming here this morning. I'm looking forward very much to hearing what everybody has to say. I am very pleased to introduce His Excellency Kawamura Yashuhisu, who has been ambassador to Canada since November 2019, after being ambassador to the United Nations and having served in important leadership positions at Japan's diplomatic missions in India, in the United States, and to the OECD, among others. Muzukashi hanashi o nukinishite. Kawamura daishi o shokai shimasu no de minasan issho ni kaike shite kudasai. Kawamura san yoroshiko onagai itashimasu. Hi, uh, Dr. Simon, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction with a excellent uh, Japanese uh, language. Um, I'm not uh, confident uh, whether my remarks uh, will be uh, easier uh, for you to understand, but I'll, I'll try my best. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words. Um, a Dr. Howard Alper, uh, former Vice President Research, the University of Ottawa, uh, former Vice Chair, Riken Advisory Council, and Chair, Global Excellence Initiative Canvassing Committee. Dr. Yuko uh, Harayama, Executive Director, Charged of International Affairs at RIKEN. 
Ms. Uh, Ms. Melania uh, Killings, uh, Executive Director, International Innovation Office, NRC, distinguished speakers and audience. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for uh, joining us in this seminar. Um, thank you very much to all uh, who greatly contributed to this webinar, especially the speakers and the University of Ottawa. Japan and Canada have enjoyed over 90 years of diplomatic uh, relations, as Dr. Simons uh, introduced in the beginning. Uh, today, we have strong and positive relations that even covers the challenge of COVID-19. Since the inauguration of the Suga cabinet last September, uh, there have been uh, two rounds of telephone meetings between uh, two prime ministers. In their latest meeting earlier this month, um, two prime ministers reaffirmed their cooperation in response to COVID-19 and climate change. Japan places high priority in its global leadership in science, technology, and innovation. The role of science and technology has become even greater during the pandemic and in the post-pandemic world in order to respond to global challenges posed by COVID-19 the economy, security, and climate change, as well as rapidly advancing digitalization. The world's fastest supercomputer, Japan's Fugaku, is also contributing um, in the uh, response to the pandemic. For example, through coronavirus droplets simulation and drug candidate screening. At the World Economic Forum's Davos agenda in January, Prime Minister Suga announced that Japan would uh, proactively create a new regime engine for growth in the post-pandemic world, which will provide hope to the future world economy and mentioned that the keys to it would be green and digital. He said that in order to achieve 2050 carbon neutrality and advanced digitalization, Japan would put high importance on science, technology, and innovation and put all of our efforts together to lead the world in international joint research and international standard rule making in these fields. He announced that Japan would target a total research and development investment of 120 trillion Japanese yen in the next five years, proactively enhance the growth of STI and host the Global Technology uh, governance Summit in Tokyo this, this coming April with support from the World Economic Forum. Japan and Canada have been actively discussing STI policies and bilateral research cooperation since they signed the agreement on cooperation in science and technology in 1986. For instance, in April 2019, a Japanese company, Advanced Te Telecommunications Research Institute uh, International, ATR, and the National Research Council signed the MOU uh, during Prime Minister Abe's visit to Canada. Even during the pandemic, uh, we have signed additional cooperation agreements. For example, last year, the Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research signed a memorandum of, of cooperation and the Faculty of Medical Sciences of the University of Fukui signed an academic exchange uh, agreement and student mobility agreement with the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Ottawa. Moreover, last November, the NRC and RIKEN co-organized an online workshop on supercomputers, including the world's uh, Fugaku. Uh, we hope to see more collaboration in various areas, such as uh, nanotechnology, health science, aerospace, AI, and so forth, which were recognized as priority areas at the last Japan-Canada uh, Joint uh, Committee uh, meeting on science and technology cooperation. As written in G7 Science and Technology Minister's declaration, enhancing such collaboration between Japan and Canada is very important, not only for promotion of STI cooperation in itself, but also for making international science and technology cooperation in the areas such as on um, AI, consistent with human rights, fundamental freedoms, and our shared democratic values. 
there are uh, great potentials in Japan and Canada, science and technology um, cooperation. In today's webinar, we will discuss the challenges and the opportunities of Japan-Canada SDI collaborations during and after the pandemic, the academic achievements of Japan-Canada uh, research collaborations. I hope this webinar will kick off for our two countries' public discussion in SDI cooperation. I hope to see more discussions to follow uh, in the future uh, to further enhance Japan-Canada SDI collaborations involving government, academia, and the private sector. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So I would now like to ask Professor Alper to moderate the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Simon. Your Excellency um, Ambassador Kawamura, we greatly appreciated your speech, including enthusiastic support for Japan-Canada collaboration in science and technology. Domo arigato. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi aussi d'accueillir tous et tous au webinaire d'aujourd'hui sur faire face ensemble à la pandémie, coopération scientifique et technologique entre le Canada et le Japon. Nous aimerions vous présenter les points séants de la coopération entre les deux pays et vous parlera des plans pour développer des collaborations encore plus vivantes à l'avenir. Canada and Japan have had, uh, as the ambassador noted, a cooperation agreement for 35 years. In recent times, there really has been meaningful progress in expanding collaborations between researchers in science and technology and in areas of priority to both nations. For example, as the ambassador uh, cited, the Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development, AMED, and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research recently announced support for projects in epigenetics, led by researchers at Tokyo University in partnership with the University of Manitoba, at Japan's National Cancer Center Research Institute and Simon Fraser University, working in a collaborative manner, as well as Rikin and McGill University, who are here uh, with representatives who will speak later. About one year ago, as you know, COVID-19 spread around the world and lockdowns could have seriously constrained our partnerships. However, Thanks to digitized exchanges, our collaborations have flourished in these challenging times. For instance, the successful workshop organized by McGill University in Rican just last month, January 26, 27, had more than 170 participants. Furthermore, the National Research Council of Canada has been very active in working with Rican and with other institutes and organization in Japan, including ATR referred to earlier and AIST amongst others. Our objective today is to provide you with highlights of recent and current Canada-Japan STI partnerships and to outline plans to develop more vibrant collaboration in the future. We anticipate that this inaugural webinar will lead to new discoveries and inventions to be showcased in different venues in the next several years. I will now ask the speakers from the uh, partner organizations to give their presentations. To the audience, uh, those of you who wish to make comments and, or ask questions, please do so in the Q&A a uh, box uh, located uh, towards the bottom of your screen. And we'll deal with these after the presentations and, and as well 
two to three issues that I raised with the panel to be uh, considered. So I am delighted now to introduce Dr. Uh, Ms. Melanie Cullens to talk about NRC's activities on research and support for SMEs, small and medium enterprises, as well as cooperation during COVID-19 and beyond between NRC and RIKEN and with other organizations in Japan. Melanie. Good morning and good evening. I'm Melanie Cullens, Executive Director of the International Innovation Office of the National Research Council of Canada. I'd like to thank Ambassador Kawamura, Dr. Alper, and our host, Professor Simon, for the opportunity to speak with you today, alongside colleagues from Regan and McGill University. Je serai content de prendre les questions en français, et notre présentation sera disponible en français aussi. NRC has a long history of collaboration with Japan. And in fact, our first co-publication dates back to 1960. And while much collaboration has followed since, we felt there was great opportunity to deepen relations. And in 2018, we embarked on an initiative to increase our engagement with Japan. Of course, as we were ramping up, COVID-19 arrived. And we, like everybody, had to adapt. Today, I'll speak briefly about the National Research Council of Canada, NRC. I'll then provide a snapshot of our engagement with Japan, followed by discussion on how we've adapted since COVID. The NRC is Canada's largest federal research and development organization. We're committed to advancing knowledge through science, supporting the Government of Canada's science agenda, including the Innovation and Skills Plan, and supporting business innovation. The NRC delivers value to Canada both via its national network of researchers and facilities, as well as offering direct support to industry through our Industrial Research Assistance Program, IRAP. We are well positioned both in Canada and abroad to create and maintain valuable linkages and networks to help transfer knowledge and solutions, work with universities and public sector partners, and to generate new business opportunities for Canadian small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. Each year, our scientists, engineers, and business experts work closely with thousands of Canadian firms, helping them bring new innovations to market. NRC fosters collaboration in pursuit of research excellence. Collaboration centers co-located at either an NRC or partners research facility enables researchers from both organizations to share access to specialized equipment, work side by side on collaborative projects, and provide training opportunities for young scientists. Areas of focus range from extreme photonics with the University of Ottawa to ocean engineering with Memorial University. In addition, NRC challenge programs are designed to enable us to partner with public and private sector, academic and other research organizations, both in Canada and internationally to advance transformative high risk, high reward research to address Canadian priorities. Grants and contributions funding is provided for collaborators offering complementary expertise, both academic institutions and SMEs. Current challenges are shown on this slide with new, Amer new areas emerging this year. And you may note that NRC has created a pandemic response challenge to fast track R&D aimed to address Canada's COVID needs. IRAP provides a comprehensive suite of innovation services and funding to help drive SME growth and stimulate wealth creation in Canada. Serving over 8,000 SME clients annually, the program provides advice, connections, and funding, supports youth employment, and links innovative Canadian SMEs into global value chains. Last year, IRAP had a contributions budget of over $330 million for SMEs, <clears throat> with a focus on supporting these SMEs to develop innovative technologies and succeed in a global marketplace. As I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, NRC decided back in 2018 that we wanted to deepen our collaboration with Japan. Canada and Japan have a long and vibrant history of R&D collaboration, having signed a science and technology treaty in 1986 and having realized over 11,000 co-publications between 2015 and 2019, nearly 3,000 in 2020. NRC accounts for several hundred of these, with 52 last year alone. 
And I would highlight that despite our current inability to travel to Japan, momentum continues. NRC signed 22 agreements with 16 Japanese organizations in 2020 and another nine since January 2021. Since 2019, we've also held a number of matchmaking opportunities to connect 140 Canadian SMEs with about 65 Japanese companies. In October 2019, NRC opened its first international office right next to Tokyo Station. Mr. Sasaki, or Sasaki-san, heads the office, and he is the former CEO of Fujitsu Laboratories and CTO of Fujitsu Limited, so we're very pleased to have him with us. He has been helping NRC to connect with Japanese companies, universities, and research institutes. And I can tell you that today, without a doubt, NRC's profile in Japan has never been higher. In the lead up to opening our Japan office, NRC signed an MOU in April 2019 with the Advanced Telecommunications Research Institute International, or ATR, witnessed by Prime Minister Trudeau and then Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. We are currently working with ATR on virtual reality cognitive exercises using a brain machine interface. ATR is also supporting us in working with Canadian SMEs, and I'll touch on that a bit later. I also wish to note that we signed an MOU with the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, ICE, when the NRC president visited Japan in October 2019. We now have a number of research collaborations with ICE. In terms of connecting with leaders of key partner organizations in Japan, such as NIDO, JST, ICE, and, and RIKIN, who of course are here with us today, the STS Forum, the Science and Technology in Society Forum, brings together all of these key players with a number of different events in a one week period, providing a great opportunity to engage. We do participate in the STS Forum and we've been a member in fact since 2018. So two of the key events associated with this are the Research Institute Leader Summit and the Funding Agency Presidents Meeting, where NRC is able to connect with its counterparts, not only from Japan, but from around the world. Of course, this year, uh, these events did not happen in person given the pandemic, but we have continued to engage virtually. And that's a good segue perhaps into the post COVID pivot. So while not the subject of today's discussion, I did wish to highlight that NRC has played an important role in responding to the pandemic, from protecting its own people through to protecting the health of Canadians and supporting our many clients and collaborators through these challenging times. Coming back to our international partnerships, we were very concerned about the impact of travel restrictions on momentum. And so we embarked on a very steep learning curve on how to best engage virtually on what would have been in-person meetings missions, actual collaboration to a virtual world. And so while limiting informal networking and presenting challenges for new relationship development, effective virtual platforms can also allow for greater participation as the time and cost of engaging is lower. But I'd like to highlight a virtual workshop on high performance computing that we held in October with RECAN. 31 NRC staff took part in the discussion and even more researchers from RECAN, a great example of how virtual platforms can be used to engage more people. The discussions led to the identification of complementary capabilities between NRC and RECAN in areas involving simulation and machine learning. As a result, NRC, RECAN, Kyushu University and the University of Alberta collaborated on a new approach to model the way COVID infects cells. The manuscript was just recently accepted for publication. There are now ongoing discussions about the use of NRC's modeling software for COVID-19 drug screening using Rikin's Fugaku supercomputer, the world's fastest. To mention a few other engagements with larger groups of people, we have had a series of workshops with JAXA Aeronautics um, on the priority areas of aircraft safety, virtual testing, lightning protection, and the cabin experience. We expect to have another in March with follow-up in the fall. And NRC Natural Resources Canada and ICE also held a workshop on satellite imaging to talk about opportunities on hyperspectral and synthetic aperture radar imaging. And with the vast amounts of data generated by new satellites, we expect that AI will be part of these collaborations. 
And finally, I'd like to highlight that NRC researchers will give two presentations on NRC automotive applications at the JSAE Annual Spring Congress, one of Japan's largest automotive congresses in May 2021. So you can see the collaboration is uh, varied and significant. Coming to virtual matchmaking for Canadian SMEs, in addition to our initiatives on collaborative R&D between NRC Research and Japan, we are supporting Canadian SMEs to pursue co-innovation with Japanese companies. During the pandemic, NRC's collaboration with ATR has continued to enable Canadian SMEs to reach Japanese partners virtually rather than physically, as was the case in 2019. We've held two online pitching sessions with two to three companies selected for virtual acceleration program and ongoing introductions to Japanese firms. Another summit, another opportunity, the Innovation Leader Summit presents a platform for Canadian SMEs to connect with Japanese companies. We first piloted this in 2019 with eight Canadian SMEs, and this year, of course, have gone virtual with six SMEs already scheduled for meetings with potential Japanese partners. I'd highlight as well, we work closely with the Trade Commissioner Service and the Embassy of Canada in Tokyo to support companies, and there is an upcoming matchmaking event. And you've got a link um, to our website on this slide if you'd like more information on this and our other initiatives. Japan's new energy and industrial technology development organization, NIDO, invited Canada for the first time to a joint call for proposals under Eurostars. And already we have two Canada-Japan projects underway. In addition, Japan's science and technology agency, JST, has invited NRC to partner on a call for proposals on COVID-19 research in non-medicinal sciences, which just closed a few weeks ago on February 1st. So to wrap up, I wanted to highlight some of the areas where we see strong potential for collaboration. Advanced manufacturing is one which has been in place for some time and where there's still much opportunity to build. And many of these you may note would align very well with our challenge programs. One in particular where we're exploring new opportunities is our aging in place challenge program, which is aiming to develop technologies to support a sustainable model for long-term care shifting the focus toward preventive home-based and community-based care. And uh, I think both Canada and Japan are, are clearly facing a common challenge here and have many areas where there is complementary capability to bring to the table to solve these mutual challenges. So before turning the discussion to Regan, our highly valued partner with which we anticipate further future collaboration, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity today, and I look forward to your questions and to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie, uh, for that excellent presentation. It's a um, great honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. Yuko Harayama to tell us about RECAN, its international activities, including those designed to mitigate against COVID-19. Following her presentation, Dr. Harayama will introduce Dr. Ta Taniyuchi from RECON and Professor Lathrop from McGill to inform us of RECON recent outcomes and impacts of the Re McGill RECON partnership. Yuko. Thank you, Dr. Alpra, for your kind introductions. Monsieur um, Ambassador, uh, chers collègues and amis, uh, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi de vous faire présenter la, notre institution d'IKEM en quelques minutes seulement et de présenter notre stratégie de la collaboration internationale. Um, L'IKEM, I, I hope when, uh, during the course of this year, you have opportunity to visit in person l'IKEM site, but for the moment, we still stay with virtual one. So BIKEN is a national science institute, um, Japan's most comprehensive research institute, devoted for natural sciences, uh, including physics, chemistry, plant science, nuclear physics, engineering, health, medicine, and AIs, and many others, and conducing cutting-edge research in a wide range of scientific fields. 
And we have celebrated 100 year anniversary in 2017, so long history. Uh, we have more than 3,000 staff, uh, including Vancouver, non Japanese. It's much more than average Japanese institution. And we really engage to really have international collaboration. So actually, we have 260 trees. And also, we have many sites and laboratories. We represented with 12 centers and eight facilities, including, as we discussed already, uh, high performance computing infrastructure, uh, food gains, and also um, many others, including synchrotron radiation facilities. And uh, in Japan, we are mostly uh, recognized uh, scientific institution with uh, more than 2,500 papers published and high cited papers. So uh, related to the strategy uh, for international collaboration, we have three main uh, axes. One is through people, recruiting and fostering global leaders, uh, receiving from abroad uh, researchers and the young scientists, and also sending from Japan. And this is really a tying uh, between several countries and in particular with Canada. And also we try to establish and manage global research centers so we have our campus in Japan, but we have many joint laboratory within Japanese universities, but outside Japan, we have several research centers. And also we have to work on global scale problem uh, for sustainable society. So we are tackling uh, SDGs and also trying to collaborate not only in Japanese context, but globally. Related the relationship with, between Riken and Canada, we have already so many collaboration with Canadian institutions. As already mentioned, we had recently uh, last year, Riken NRC High Performance Computing Workshop. And also we tried to have really uh, developing collaboration uh, between several centers in DECAN and NRC. Related universities, we have McGill universities with MOU and not only on the paper, but concretely taking action to have very ongoing project we will discover just in a few minutes. And with the University of Toronto, uh, Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithm, and we are working with on AI, with the Bechtel Institute for AI, and the brain science, and also, not only uh, research collaboration, but exchange of people. So, for example, we have the participant from Brain Canada uh, coming to the CAN on site for CBS uh, summer schools. Unfortunately, last year we have been limited to exchange in person, but we did some exchange virtually, and hopefully this year, this year we will have more exchange in person. So just to summarize, we um, can response to COVID-19. Uh, even our research activities have been reduced to, due to COVID-19 uh, propagation, but we, we kept uh, ongoing uh, all the research proposal related to COVID-19. So first of all, to better understanding uh, SARS-CoV-2 and developing diagnosis tools. And also we try to develop therapies and vaccines. And uh, we use our high computer computing uh, to have simulations and prediction using Fugaku. And not only on the life science bio domain, but we try to understand social reactions. So combining AI tools to really having understanding and social impact of COVID-19. And to do that, we try to 
put into practice open science by sharing data with globally and serving to global uh, community. And I would like to mention to switch to the concrete action between Japan and Canada, genome analysis to identify genetic factors associated with individual differences in susceptibility to COVID-19. And this is the topics you'll be dis discovering uh, with my colleague, uh, Ichiro Takeuchi and his partner in Canada. So I'm turning to Ichiro to present his work. So Ichiro Takeuchi, the floor is yours. Um, so uh, I would like to introduce my uh, Riken Center for Integrated Medical Science, IMS and they're headed by the uh, director, Dr. Uh, Katahiko Yamamoto. This IMS center consists of this uh, four research divisions. The one focused on the genome medicines and the other one is focused on the uh, human immunology. And this IMS center was initiated in 2013 by merging the two former uh, life science centers who focus on the genome medicines and then immunologists. So therefore we have long history to have the expertise in studying the genome, human genome medicine and immunologists. And the current for, uh, structure of IMS is started by 2018 by uh, merging with another uh, genome science research centers, um, uh, CRSTs. So uh, we have the, uh, some expertise in uh, human genomes and then in, in human immunology. And also, as you may know, uh, McGill University also have the uh, genome centers headed by Dr. Uh, Mark Rastrop. So strengthening the ties to Japan in genomics and the medicines. Um, uh, this, this is also the, uh, the research areas they focusing on by the McGill Genome Centers. Again, uh, this McGill universities also uh, have strengths in, in their expertise in genomics and immunology and also uh, AI areas. Again, this Deakin IMS has the uh, long history to focus on the genome medicine and the human immunology. So we have been discussing that work together to contribute to better human health at the worldwide levels. Because this uh, Deakin and the McGee universities uh, made an MOU for research co collaboration in 2010, mainly in physics and technologies. So uh, at these Deacon IMS and the McGill Genomic Center start to uh, discussion to stimulate the partnership in also medicine and biology areas. And then we started this uh, ideas by in invitations of the lecturers and students for Deacon IMS summer program from 2014. And then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Philip Gross and Dr. Mark Rastrop visited Deakin IMS to discuss how we uh, uh, activate this international partnership in 2016. And then eventually we made MOU between McGee University and Deakin IMS centers. This includes uh, to hold the annual workshop between these two organizations and then set up the uh, laboratories um, uh, at each side, and then also extend the young researcher, the student. Actually, uh, we keep holding the annual workshop, workshop since 2017 at Montreal and Yokohama, Japan, where I am is located. Uh, we had three times on on-site uh, um, uh, workshop, but and fourth workshop was planned to be held at the Yokohama in 2020 April, but. Unfortunately, it was, it, uh, that was postponed due to the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. However, uh, to keep the uh, but, uh, actual uh, exchange of the information, we hold the online virtual symposiums uh, in last month by using these Zoom uh, meetings. And then uh, like 200 uh, uh, people participate from the, uh, both sides. 
So uh, IMS is very have the long histories to work on the human genome medicines. And then we uh, collaborated with the Biobank uh, project and then uh, collecting the uh, samples like DNA and serum from 200,000 individuals with the uh, 47 disease, the patient and the healthy control. And Dickens um, uh, uh, developed the uh, data analysis pipeline, so-called genome-wide association studies to identify the uh, gen genomic factors associating with disease development. So this is a picture the how this, the automated DNA from the each human individual is stored. And there is the uh, um, automatic pipelines and then this slide show the academic outcomes by using the GBUS technologies uh, that is initiated first in the Dickens at 2003, but the number of the uh, uh, publications uh, in the journals is quite clearly increasing from the initiating that. And then currently, uh, uh, genome wide GBUS or genome wide association study is recognized. A uh, very useful way to identify the genomic factors associated with, with the disease susceptibilities. So, uh, 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 in this the COVID nineteen errors, we um, became IMS and the Mac University discussed how we can face the, these COVID nineteen. And the McGill University is a center of collecting the human uh, genomic data in Canada. And then we have the uh, long study to analyze the human genomic data like using the GBUS. So right by using the uh, analysis pipeline in Dickens, uh, we will uh, face or, for, or attackers to identify are there any genetic factors associated with individual difference in susceptibility to COVID-19 like a virus transmission, severity of disease, sudden aggravation or second disease. Are there any genetic factors is associated with these types? And also, uh, we also, uh, two young uh, uh, young researchers, we talk on the epigenetic change in innate immunities. And they will also analyze uh, how this uh, trend immunity, so-called trend immunity is, is enhanced by epigenetic changes. So this uh, is the one example how we tackle to identify the uh, uh, factors associating with the COVID-19 or individual difference in the humans. So the mobile genetic element is a major source of, of the genetic difference between humans, but uh, this mobile genetic element is composed mainly from transposons or virus derived and then, but it is very hard to detect by existing methods of this mobile genetic element. Uh, one researcher of Dr. Uh, Parrish at Dickens developed a new tool to detect the genotype, uh, genotype polymorphism of mobile element. And then using his new uh, uh, tools, then we are uh, uh, trying to, to test if the mobile element polymorphism is influenced COVID-19 phenotype. Uh, working together with Dr. Lastrop and then Dr. Richard and McGill's. And also we test how uh, mobile element polymorphism influence the brain phenotypes uh, together with Dr. Uh, uh, Brooks at McGill's. Also uh, two young PIs at the Dr. Langris at McGill and Dr. Uh, J. Singh at Deakin IMS uh, work together to do a uh, single cell Develop the new technology for single cell probing of epigenetic memory in immunities. Uh, this uh, joint uh, proposal is supported by AMED at Japan side at the CIHR at Canada side. I don't go to the details, but the, uh, they try to understand the chromatin, high dimensional chromatin structures and try to develop the new technology called single molecule chromatin captures. And the father uh, developed, the, the applied this new technology to understand this high dimensional chromatin structure at the single cell levels. So this is the um, uh, roadmap of their proposals. Uh, this uh, proposals for three years and the both Japan team and the Canada teams work together to uh, for the technology development and then uh, 
uh, develop also the uh, uh, analysis pipelines. So uh, under this Deakin and the McGee University International Partnership, important thing is to exchange the human resources, including the younger generations, to nurture the, this younger generation to uh, let them pioneer the new research field. For instance, uh, we are uh, 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 thinking it is important to combine artificial intelligence to the bio, to apply to biology and the medicines. So uh, now we are having a lot of the data at the similar level of the uh, biology, like genome, transcriptom, proteome, metabolome, micro, uh, microbiome. But this, a lot of the biomedical data should be uh, examined by uh, artificial intelligence technology to apply to um, the disease predictions, drug efficacy, or new drug researches. So um, this is the uh, uh, um, activities between Deakin and McGill universities, but the uh, McGill University also have another international partnership with the, one of the top university in Japan, Kyoto. So uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Rockshop briefly explained these uh, activities. Mark, please. <coughs> yes. Thank you very much uh, for the, to the organizers, Monsieur the Ambassador, and uh, Monsieur for uh, his uh, excellent overview of some of our work. Um, and the uh, I just wanted to complete this by speaking about educational opportunities. Uh, Rikin is not itself an educational organization. Institute, uh, and but but we're very keen, uh, certainly at the University of McGill, to encourage uh, exchanges for our young investigators and our students, and indeed, international exchange for students in PhD programs is increasingly worldwide an important feature of of training. Uh, having experience in multiple research systems. Uh, is a is is a important for career development. In fact, can be career changing for 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 students. So, uh, and we would we want to exchange uh, students with uh, with Rican. And so, one of the things that we've done is to set up a joint uh, Japan Canada PhD program, which will allow, uh, amongst others. Uh, opportunities for students, the ability to 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 undertake uh, their research or part of their research with the RECAN. So this is a McGill Kyoto Top Global University program, uh, which was set, uh, uh, a program which was set up by the MEXT uh, a number of years ago. Uh, we made the, this uh, proposal to the MEXT for this joint PhD program. Uh, with Kyoto University, and the students are accepted into the joint program and share their time between the two universities. They end up with a PhD degree, which is awarded jointly by the by both universities. So this is a this is a new opportunity which uh, um, which we're we've been promoting uh, with the recruitment of four students, uh, up to four students per year, two from Japan and two from Canada. And as I said, the training environment can extend to, to, to the Recon. <coughs> and just perhaps a last word to thank, uh, first of all, the Fonds de Recherche de Quebec, uh, who which has been the chief scientific officer of Quebec, who has been the, uh, a key uh, sponsor of both our collaboration with the RECAN and this uh, uh, joint PhD program that I mentioned. Uh, Monsieur Izawawa, also at the, it was the Consul General uh, since, uh, since 2018 uh, in Montreal for Japan, has been very supportive of this, uh, of this, uh, of this work. And uh, I think we'll have a chance to come back to talk about how the COVID has impacted 
uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the opportunities uh, that we've had, both uh, negatively in terms of movement of individuals, but also positively in the way that we've been able to mobilize to attack uh, uh, this major public health issue uh, jointly with Japan. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yuko um, and Drs. Uh, Taniuchi and Lathrop for those very informative presentations. We've kept the time extremely well up to now, which I'm very pleased about. And so I would like to go on to the next part, raise uh, three issues for the panel to discuss. And then we will open it up to the Q's, whatever Q's and A's we have. And I just remind uh, anyone wishing to comment or raise a question to one or more members of the panel, please do so uh, in the interim between now and the end of the discussion of the three uh, issues. Uh, so we can take up those points and, and have them addressed in a, in a very satisfactory manner. The first uh, question I'd like to bring forward concerns really the impact of COVID-19, the pandemic. And as uh, a number of you have noted, that has uh, restricted international travel quite severely. Uh, so in that context and the other, beside travel, the other issues raised by several of you how have the institutes in Japan and in Canada worked together to promote international research collaboration under these conditions? And what do you see as the greatest challenge, uh, challenges and uh, greatest opportunities? So whoever, whoever would like to contribute, please unmute yourself and uh, contribute to the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you. So maybe I will start. Um, I'd say first of all, that we were pleasantly surprised at the momentum we were able to keep. I think where we've had existing relationships in areas where we can work virtually, um, such as with the supercomputer. Um, so digital uh, areas of that nature certainly are, are easier to manage. We've seen a lot of goodwill and a lot of real effort to connect and to continue the work. Um, you know, there are, I suppose on the upside is a much lessened barrier to participation in the sense that travel is not required. So we have more people attending conferences, more people in the workshops. Um, on the other hand though, I'd say we're still very much challenged by time zones and very grateful. <laughs> I say to have an office in Tokyo um, and somebody who is living in that time zone. Um, I'd say our, our main concerns right now are around some of the experimental research where we want to have people accessing equipment. Um, and we do have some equipment of, of ours and partners languishing in boxes because we haven't been able to bring the people to the facilities to actually structure those and, and move ahead. And we're a little worried as well for early career researchers, um, simply for the reason that while they can attend the conferences, they're missing out on all of the informal serendipitous collisions, which are, are essential for them to, uh, to build their networks and move ahead. Um, so on that, we're trying to think through different ways of approaching it, certainly talking with senior established researchers to open up their Rolodexes and, and help earlier career researchers engage and connect. And um, when it comes to, uh, to equipment and other things, we're, we're working to look at having postdocs on the ground, right? In Japan, perhaps who could come in and collaborate rather than sending a Canadian at this point in time. And um, so I, I think we're still working on solutions there. Um, I would mention maybe just quickly as well on the SME side of things. And um, 
And my first career was in international business development with SMEs on critical systems, um, engaging in co-innovation, which is essential to being able to access some markets where there's a, a lot of, of a need really for trust, sharing intellectual property and working together is, um, is still challenging. So we've had some success in some sectors with continuing to connect. And uh, we we're very, very grateful to our partners, ATR and others on the ground for helping to make the links, but we have seen some areas slow down. Um, our other concern on that front is we used to do SME missions. So you'll have the CEO, the CTO of, the, of company X who was on the ground for seven days, really engaged, focused in on the collaboration. And today we're doing virtual events and the focus is different. Okay, and it's very easy to get pulled back into day-to-day -day activities as opposed to, to staying in a space until relationships are fully developed. Um, so I, I'd say, again, it's been mixed. Um, it's, it's important to be creative right now. Thanks. Thanks, Melanie. And, and uh, those were very informative, uh, pointing to the challenges and also the opportunities. Anyone else wish to contribute on this point? So this is Yuko. Go ahead. So we had a similar experience as explained by Melanie. Uh, we, we know that we had to really switch to online and also uh, disrupted uh, all, the, uh, all the ongoing works. But we have to really uh, find a new way of working. So new style is there. And really, uh, we have some kind of positive side of this disruption is that you can attend any meeting, uh, staying at home. And also we have more successful seminars, uh, not only particip participated by Japan, but internationally, it's so easy to set up international meeting and no cost and no carbon print, uh, footprint. So it's positive aspect. But as uh, has been said by Melanie, if you know already each other, it's quite easy to switch online. But if we are looking after a new partner or if we are a newcomer in the science field, early career researchers, it's, there's no way to really chatting or really uh, sharing your concern in a spontaneous way. So by the past, we had serendipity really playing huge role. But today we have to design intentionally this kind of serendipity. And it can be done online, but we have to carefully arrange uh, additional meeting beside the former meeting in the way that people may uh, find some new partners, but in not the arranged way. So that's something that we are exploring and we feel quite comfortable after one year experiences and we can switch into the more hybrid type of meeting. Uh, that's where we are. And in particular for those who are working in a wet lab, it was catastrophe at the beginning. But now we can uh, try to really set up a secure environments within laboratory in the way that they can come to work on the wet lab but uh, limiting the number of people within. So we know how to deal with it. So it's ongoing process, but I'm not so desperate. Yeah, thank you. That, those were excellent comments. Mark, you wanted to make comment. Yeah, I had a few comments. Uh, of course, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, and certainly it's the this situation has promoted changes in the way that we organized meetings and that uh, can be have successes uh, as we found out with, for example, with the McGill, recent McGill Recon meeting, which attracted a very large audience because of its virtual nature. 
For students, however, that's been it's been quite challenging, and particularly in some of our students who are between university in Japan and a university in Canada, and and haven't uh, they found themselves uh, placed in one place or the other, or even at neither of those universities, and that's been that's been a challenging point. But but many of the activities we have in genomic medicine or biology in general have become quantitative. And so they the access to data can be virtual and, 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 and work can continue. But it, it's also a barrier in the sense that much, many of those data sets are medical in their nature and the tra transmission or the access to that information across country boundaries, in, including Japan and Canada, is not necessarily very always easy. So one of the things that we're doing with the RECAN and Ishiro has been promoting this is uh, setting up a, a working group which will deal with the ethical issues involved in exchanges of uh, person, personalized uh, for personal data uh, that may be medically related. Anonymized, even anonymized data can be challenging to, to, to transmit in this way. So we'll be looking into those issues and uh, over the next few months. Thank you. Ichiro, do you have any comments you wish to add? Yeah, I totally agree with the comments based by the three people. And then we are fortunate because we have the, some three of years the relationship already established between Nike and IMS. So it's not so difficult to exchange the information with known collaborators, but as we pointed out, establish the new partners for um, between the younger generation, they, it's not so easy. It's how we um, like elder researchers enhance the young generation to uh, actively communicate with the new collaborator. That is the, uh, we have to adapt and then maybe the hybrid type or, but uh, after this one year COVID-19, also we are realizing to set up the meeting with the uh, overseas collaborator is not, it's re relatively easier than before because we can use this online meeting easily uh, than before because just texting in an email, but now we can set up this kind of a face-to-face -face online meeting. That is a good thing. And also, as the Mark pointed out, to uh, exchange the data, then we have to set up the social uh, or regulations between the two countries, how we can control the data access. That is the other uh, uh, um, urgent issues to stimulate the international collaboration. Then, we said uh, we had the, the satellite meeting to uh, con how to delegate the bioethics issues between these two countries. That is the one good thing to uh, how uh, we can accelerate this international partnership. Thank you. Good. I'll just add a personal uh, note. I just came prior to this webinar from a meeting of the Athena Forum, which is the UK a body uh, dealing with advancing women in science and uh, addressing other issues um, for equality and inclusion. And it's very interesting, the, the last chair, a professor of Cambridge, from Cambridge made a very good point about meeting in person rather than <clears throat> on Zoom or Microsoft team, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, um, the main advantage of being face-to-face -face with somebody or a group is the flow of ideas. No matter how informal you try to make it online, it's not so easy to achieve. It doesn't mean it will, can't be success, but recognize the challenge from a social point of view, which impacts uh, new ideas, new discoveries, et cetera, which I thought was a 
Excellent point. Thank you for that. Let's go on to the second um, issue. So we have participants uh, watching. Uh, there are 58 altogether uh, as of now, and they come from various backgrounds. Could you tell us how the accomplishments or achievements out of the research collaboration between our two countries, institute and university, et cetera, et cetera, how they can be or will impact uh, daily life or contribute to a better society, more successful society? Anyone who wishes to speak of the previous speakers. Well, Probably okay. I start. <laughs> uh, it's a big question because uh, nowadays almost all scientists uh, uh, request to contribute not only in science but also sub society uh, addressing uh, societal challenges, global challenges. And we are moving more and more in this way. But in fact, according to on which topics you are working, you are quite far from societal issues and probably you are within. And these differences is really um, uh, perceived by some scientists and what it could be interesting is really uh, exchanging ideas and the situation with different background scientists uh, to better configure and shape your mindset. And that's uh, much easier to go outside Japan because in Japan, the way we are training scientists, it's quite still in the traditional way you have senior faculty members and uh, at the top and you are following uh, you know, tradition way. And we have to go outside to discover the different way of thinking and also discovering uh, different approaches coming from different disciplines and much easier to go outside because it's so different and you can capture new way of doing science and also serving society. So something that we can explore between Japan and Canada. For example, uh, in Canada, when I have occasion to discuss with those who are charged for science technology innovation, they're keen about endogenous people or traditional knowledges. Uh, this kind of concern, uh, we do not have so much and then uh, we can discover again, you know, coming back to Tokyo, to Japan, to see the differently the value of traditional knowledge or something like that. So it's opening eyes, opening doors. Thank I you. Stop here. Excellent. Melanie and then Mark. Melanie. Great. Thanks. Um, I think on this, we've been working with Japan for many, many years um, in many different areas. And much of what we do may not be visible to the general public, um, but they're certainly touched by it, <laughs> I may say. Um, so I think, for example, about electric car batteries, where we've worked jointly on making sure they're safe. Okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, to me, uh, an important outcome. Um, we work together on metrology. Um, so things like measuring the kilograms so that we can enable trade. Um, on the construction side, we've worked with Japan to help them understand how to build wood construction, right? And, and to feel safe in wood construction. And um, I suppose one other I'd mention is maybe carbon fiber for, for aircrafts where we've done work together. So it's, it's quite varied. And um, while there isn't always a lot of fanfare, that, that research is leading to real results for, for people. And I, I would agree uh, with Yuko that we're more and more challenged and mission-based in trying to look at 
taking advantage of science towards solutions, but it does take time. And, um, and you often have serendipitous results, which will also show up. Um, for us as well, part of our, our focus is on trying to ensure that what we are doing um, and learning and the knowledge we're creating is transformed to be useful. And so we do have um, with that, of course, our, our own business services working directly with industry to ensure that uh, we're able to commercialize. And together with Japan, we have been focused as well on some of the large uh, Japanese firms and trying to connect those dots so that we can ensure that the results of our research are, are useful on a global basis. Thanks so much for that uh, excellent comment. Mark? Yes, I just, the, the mcgill Recon collaboration, as you heard, was uh, around the in the field of genomic medicine and medicine is being transformed by our approaches to this using different new biolo biology technologies to become much more of a personalized uh, uh, type of uh, medicine or precision medicine as it's called these, the, the emergence of this is uh, being driven by uh, the type of research that, uh, that uh, Ishiro was speaking to in our collaboration and, you know, has, has many potential for transforming the health of our populations. The important point here, though, in the international collaboration is that um, that or an important point is that the differences between or the contrast between health issues in different countries and different ethnic groups is a very important feature of the type of work that we're doing so that by bringing together information from Japan and from Canada we get much better understanding of both how the, the biological factors are impacting health differently because of different genetic makeup, for example, but also how those factors interact with different environments. For example, the way the nutrition uh, that, that people have in, in different countries. And if you look at COVID, it's a, it's a you know, we've, we've been working very hard and as immediate response to the to the pandemic, but we have to think that COVID will be with us for a very long time because of the the long term sequela of the of the disease. And understanding how that differs in Japan and in Canada will be very important. In in more generally in our aging populations, understanding again how the features are similar and different in Japan and Canada will be a major contributor, I think, of our collaborations. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'll just note, for, for instance, our different attitudes toward vaccine implementation and accepting a vaccine in different countries and in different population groups within a country uh, is quite remarkable around the world. Okay, uh, Chiro, any to, thing to add or are you okay? Um, I'm fine, but this, I think this, the demand from the so society is that they differ in each country. And the, we are now talking mainly about Japan, Canada, that, that, that these two countries have very similar demand in, in the social. But if we look over the other countries, is the one, finding in the, the in any scientific areas can be applied it's not so important in own country but it can be applied to other countries so uh we think the the, the scientists should keep the their own eye to other countries but it's not easy because researchers is mainly supported by the tax from the own country but if if they think to how we their technology or finding can be applied to other countries, bring the benefit, then that is important thing to connect science or to the societies. So we 
it's better to have the construct some systems to apply and distribute the finding in the one country to the other uh, country to benefit to bring the benefit. That, that yeah. is my feeling. Thank you for that. Thank you all uh, for the excellent contribution to addressing this issue. Last issue, really for NRC, although others are welcome to comment, private sector's involvement is important in uh, science technology research. Is there any best practice for research collaboration between research institutes and the private sector in the context of Japan-Canada cooperation? Great. Um, so I'll take this from the context of co-innovation, um, where we have uh, companies working together um, on research challenges aimed at ultimately putting new uh, products, processes, and services on the uh, on the market. And one of the reasons that we look at supporting co-innovation with international partners is because of the additional knowledge, intelligence, uh, market access, and global value chain access that provides. Um, so I, we just we we we're still pretty recent in playing clean the co-innovation game. It's really only been since 2013 um, that NRC and IRAP have been there. We've done about 200 projects, probably worth about 500 million dollars so far. And we just did a study um, with a lot of those firms to better understand what worked for them. And one of the interesting findings in there, because we have projects where it's an SME working with an SME, an SME working with a large firm, um, et cetera. But we also have projects that we call two plus two, where we have a Canadian and, uh, and Japanese SME working with each other, but also with research institutes and universities. Um, so we haven't yet run a two plus two with Japan. Um, we're holding on and uh, we're working towards that. But what we found in the studies where we have done that, the firms came back to say having the research institute engaged in the project provided what they called a halo effect. So the credibility, the networks, the deep know-how, and the ability of those institutions to work with companies towards solutions was a really big factor in their success. Um, so certainly looking forward, um, we've got some co-innovation projects with Japan today under uh, the, the relationship with NIDO and Eurostars. Um, we'd be interested in having a two plus two with Japan in the future, um, perhaps in the aging space where we see that there is some real complementary capacity, but also um, an opportunity to, to have an you know, almost immediate impact on our two populations in an area that is such a challenge. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment? Um, I'm just reacting, bringing uh, Riken's strategy. As I said, we are really exploring international collaboration. Uh, starting point was with uh, research institutions. But today, based on our experience of collaboration within Japanese companies and Riken, we like to extend this experience outside Japan. So seeking to have, as Melanie explained, two plus two will be ideal because we know how to collaborate between institutions. But we want to associate uh, additionally uh, private sector, but uh, they should be um, trained in some sense to have collaboration with such institutions. So probably that's one way to really uh, engage bringing a private sector within. So we, we, will, we are planning uh, for the next fiscal year, starting in April 2021, to set up kind of series of workshops, something like that, to show the Ken's activity to more broader private sectors, not only limited to Japanese company, but outside uh, Japan. So we can work together in some in this direction, hopefully. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for those comments. I'll just add um, 
that there are other examples of two plus two. In fact, Canada and Israel have done two plus two, academia and industry with academia industry. And as well, uh, Denmark, Chile has participated one way or another, maybe not identically, but similar to the concept which Melanie and you, Yuko, describe. Uh, personally, I think that has great potential and especially not only for SMEs, even big companies want to partake in areas which are rather new and outside the box for them, as, as some forward-looking companies often do. So uh, thank you for the discussion. We'll now look at a question and I'll read it from uh, Raunak Karmacharya. As mental health is a challenge for both countries, are there any research collaborations between Japan and Canada in mental health research? If not, would the two countries be open to such collaboration? Thank you. Anyone wish to uh, comment? Sure, maybe I, I can make a quick comment. Um, one, I would say that raising mental health is, is important right now. Um, and during COVID in particular, with the isolation and the challenges people are dealing with, NRC has uh, certainly put a strong emphasis on mental health and, and reaching out to its people during this time. Um, we would like, as I'd mentioned, to talk about aging in place as one of the key areas of, uh, of focus with Japan. And while we are not dealing with mental health per se, what we are working on are many of the tools, the instruments, data mining and AI that might help to identify when there is a challenge um, and somebody might need an intervention. So certainly that could fit within the scope of, uh, of an aging challenge. Thank you. Any other questions? The comments in response to the uh, question. Okay. So that is the only question I, I have in the Q&A box. Um, if there are no others, then um, I want to uh, first thank you for the discussion, for your presentation discussion. And what I'd like to do now is summarize uh, the discussion and uh, with some comments, read the future. I think the presentations and discussions today really demonstrated the vitality of the Japan-Canada cooperation in science and technology. Recent and uh, current uh, cooperation, just as a summary first before giving you my view on the future, uh, included as one or more of you referred to, high performance computing workshop last October between NRC and uh, Riken, which has the Fugaku supercomputer, joint research by Riken and Kyushu University with NRC and University of Alberta on COVID-19 binding, also, um, other COVID-related project in, uh, involving NRC in Japan are now being considered for support by JST. In J <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Riken and McGill University are also developing uh, projects in, in, uh, for new directions in COVID-19 research. Looking to the future, uh, AIST, NRC, Natural Resources Canada, early this month had a workshop on satellite imaging to discuss what are the opportunities we can see can seize for maximum benefit to both countries as well as the institutions concerned and the researchers. McGill and uh, Kyoto Universities, as um, Mark referred to, Mark Lathrop, 
with support by MEXT, as well as Fonds de Recherche Québec, have ambitious plans for working together in research, uh, including the granting of joint PhD degrees. That is a meritorious objective because a number of universities in Canada, I know, have joined programs with others in other countries. The new Institute for Advanced Study of Human Biology uh, will be the centerpiece for this bold initiative. In the private sector, less than three weeks from now, it was noted that there'll be a matchmaking event in innovation to create new collaboration in the private sector. And as well, I should add, they should also consider two plus two because of the added value therein. So all that I mentioned and more possibilities like new joint research centers, you're well aware, I, I think, that other countries do this quite often, Chile and Germany, Chile and France, China and Australia. Canada has one, only one with India. And uh, because that was not exactly well constructed initially, as the then Minister of Finance told me, we need to be cautious before we scale this up. But I think now is the opportunity to, um, to create new opportunities for Japan and Canada, not only in the areas mentioned, but in other areas of national priority, be it connected to climate science, energy, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope uh, you have found this uh, webinar not only interesting, but stimulating. Uh, there's a closing note I want to refer to based on experience of a former student of mine, Kathy Crudden. Kathy is professor at Queen's University and professor at Nagoya University in the Institute of Transformative Biomolecules. She's one of the best organic chemists in the world and materials. Recently, she received an American Chemical Society Cope Scholar Award, for instance. What, what I want to convey to you relative to working in partnership was in the middle of her PhD, Kathy expressed to me desire to go elsewhere for even three months. And I said, where would you really like to go? And she said, Japan. And so I've had uh, wonderful relations with Japanese, been to Japan more than 43 times, I think 44. And I contacted Shinzi Morai at Osaka University, who's a great chemist, and he instantly agreed. That experience by Kathy Crudden, I would uh, uh, say, transformed her life. She came back energized, learned a lot of Japanese in that time, became more fluent since. Ambassador, you're welcome to speak to her and get her advice. She, uh, so she runs two research groups, one at Nagoya and one at Queens. And uh, that experience showed the other students and postdoctoral fellows in my group um, why such exchanges are valuable. And it inspired some of them to then go elsewhere to other countries and to Japan, by the way. And from Shinji uh, lab, I've had students who are now well-known professors and people working in industry in Japan. And finally, Kathy is a very close friend of Ryoji Noyori, Noyori-san who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry some years ago uh, and has benefited from uh, discussing with him often, not only chemistry, but life. So with that, I will uh, ask uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Simon to 
formally close the webinar. Scott? So I would like to thank everybody for the discussions today. I have found this to be very, very inspiring. And I think that one of the, my takeaways is that science has a very strong social side to it, which is why we actually have to get back to those in-person meetings. I think that bringing this back to international policy studies, because that's what SIPS is all about. I think that this meeting has shows that Japan and Canada share many values that can also guide our cooperation on science and technology. And I think that includes ethics, which uh, Dr. Lathrop brought up in this sharing of medical data, um, but also there are issues of intellectual property rights, human rights, et cetera, that can be discussed at other events. But all of that leads me to conclude that we really can prioritize and should prioritize new STI cooperation and educational cooperation between Canada and Japan. So I hope that this is another milestone on a long relationship in science and technology between Canada and Japan. And I want to thank everybody. Merci beaucoup, chi miigwech, and arigato gozaimashita.